easier it is for the faithful to retreat to what Isaiah Berlin called the inner citadel and to leave the sphere of activity almost entirely to civil authority. And conversely, the more a particular religion expresses itself in law, as both Islam and Judaism do, the more likely it is that this collision between religious authority and civil authority will recur, will occur. Now, in my paper, I talk about the way Christianity has dealt with this problem through the centuries, and not by accident, the idea of two swords, two kingdoms, two cities, you know, two, 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 you know, has found a very comfortable home uh, within Christianity. Not totally comfortable, but pretty comfortable. On the other hand, you know, it has been a real struggle in Islam, uh, which is not to say that it is mission impossible, but it is mission very difficult. Uh, and to this day, I had the opportunity of talking with the former president of post-revolutionary Tunisia, Rashid Ghanoushi, you know, who presided over a constitution writing process that succeeded against heavy odds. And it was very clear to me, although he was quite discreet you know, about discussing the ins and outs of that negotiation, uh, that the relative roles of religion and public law were at the center of the difficulties that needed to be overcome. And it remains to be seen whether the verbal overcoming of those problems will yield a practical resolution of the tension. I devote a lot of space in my paper to Judaism because that is, you know, that's an area that I, that, that you know, from which I learned, you know, you know, most from David Hartman, about which I learned the most from David, David Hartman. Uh, and there is a very interesting tradition that I trace in Judaism of the development of a freestanding idea of civil authority over and against religious authority, even though if one steps back a long way, Judaism and Islam look quite similar structurally. And you can see you could be you can see that development in a series of steps from the discussion of the establishment of kingship in 1 Samuel, you know, to the you know, to the brief but you know pregnant discussion in De Deuteronomy of the Torah as a kind of a constitutional constraint on kings. Uh, and this process of development of an autonomous idea of civil authority, uh, civil authority of course, accelerated you know, after the destruction of the Semple, Second Temple and the dispersion of the, disturb, dispersion of the Jewish people uh, as minorities everywhere they went. Because then they had to face the question, you know, as communal minorities in every country on earth, uh, how are we going to relate to the civil authority? And many of you know the Talmudic principles that were developed to handle that principle, you know, the law of the kingdom. You know, that is to say, if the secular authority is, is law. I've spent some time studying, you know, the thought of the head of the Barcelona Jewish community in medieval times, Nisim Garandi, you know, who very clearly developed and ideas. As a matter of fact, I'll read a couple of sentences from his thinking, which is extremely interesting. Uh, you know, he argued explicitly for two, quote, separate agencies, one to judge the people in accordance with the Torah law, the other to uphold public order. The precedent for this, Garandi insisted, was established during the biblical principle. I quote from one of his writings on the subject, at a time when Israel had both Sanhedrin and king, the Sanhedrin's role was to judge the people according to just law, that is the halakha, and not to order their affairs in any way beyond this unless the king delegated his powers to them. Garandi accepted that the secular authority would need to use coercion, quote, to enhance political order in accordance with the needs of the hour even if the application of force is, quote, undeserved according to truly just Torah law. Garandi went so far as to acknowledge that, quote, 
some of the laws and procedures of the Gentiles may be more effective in enhancing political order than some of the Torah's laws. But no matter, the king would correct these deficiencies acting in the name of political order. I could go on for quite some time. It's absolutely fascinating you know, and subtle reflection on the you know, intertwined but distinct political and religious authorities in, in medieval times. Uh, and, you know, and, and principles, principles of limitation developed. You know, how far could Torah law accommodate itself to, to civil law? And Maimonides laid down a formal principle of equal protection. You know, a law that treats likes unequally is unjust and need not be obeyed. And of course, there was, there was the doctrine that distinguishes between laws that contradict the halakha but must nonetheless be obeyed and those that contradict the halakha and cannot be obeyed. Fortunately for Jewish communities, that was a very short list, but thousands paid the ultimate price in honoring that very short list of nonetheless. Now, what does all of this, what, what does all of this have to do with my great theoretical preoccupation? That is, the nature of liberal democracy as a particular form of political community. In my judgment, all of this has just about everything to do with liberal democracy. And let me try to tell you why as briefly as I can. Everybody, I think, knows in rough and ready terms what the noun in the phrase liberal democracy means. We don't spend quite as much time thinking about the adjective. But to put it as simply and starkly as possible, the antonym of the word liberal in liberal democracy is not conservative. It's not liberal democracy versus conservative. The antonym is total or plenipotentiary. That is to say, liberal democracy is limited democracy. It argues that no matter how justly grounded democratic political authority is, that there are some aspects of human life that democratic political authority, not to mention the less legitimate forms, has no right to enter into and to regulate. Now, why might someone believe this? Well, in my reading of both the theory and the history, uh, and I suspect that Charles Taylor has a somewhat more complicated reading, but that's fine, but in my <coughs> reading, the experience of the limitation of politics arose out of the confrontation between political authority and religious authority. The more seriously one takes that confrontation, experientially, the more one is driven to try to think it through theoretically and reconcile it practically. And to put a very complex, complex historical and theoretical matter very tersely, I think that that was the grain of sand in the pearl, in, in, in the oyster, around which the pearl of liberal democracy developed. That is my, that is my thesis. So you could say that the idea of limits on political authority derives from the experience of the confrontation of political authority and religious authority. That raises the question, are there any limits to the kind of limitation that religion can impose on political authority? I, there's the problem. And the answer to that question, I would argue, have argued, will continue to argue until somebody argues, and argues me out of it, is yes. And let me be just very simple and quick about this. The first kind of limitation on the claims of religion over against the political order derives from the basic requisites of public order itself. And this is a doctrine that goes all the way back to Locke, if not farther. There are some things that are simply not to be permitted, even if they are religiously commanded. 
The clearest example of that that I can think of is human sacrifice. If some sort of neo-Aztec cult were to reconstitute itself and insist, and insist that pleasing God or the gods uh, conscientiously requires the sacrifice of individuals, even virgins, uh, the, the civil authority is not required to accommodate itself. These are, these are the sorts of forbidden activities uh, that Locke called civil concernments. They're a short but very important list. And of course, there's some things that are permitted in principle, but not always in practice. Uh, my favorite example here is a Protestant group that decides to hold a religious, noisy revival in you know, an all-night revival in the middle of a residential area. Everybody would agree, I think, that time, place, and manner regulations uh, reflecting the requisites of civil order and reasonably peaceful and respectful you know, living together with people who may not agree with what you're doing makes a certain amount of sense. There are other examples, and I've spent a great deal of time trying to work, trying to work this, these through, uh, have to do with collisions between the general purposes of civil law, on the one hand, and the specificity of religious, either individual or communal uh, self-expression on the other. One of the most controversial Supreme Court cases in recent American history arose out of a collision between the use of peyote in Native American religious ceremonies on the one hand and the very stringent drug, federal drug legislation of the United States on the other. And, uh, you know, and, and a lot of people sort of shrugged and said, well, okay. But I've recently asked, suppose we change the terms just slightly. Suppose we're not talking about peyote. Suppose we're talking about wine. Suppose when prohibition was enacted, there had been no ceremonial or sacramental legislative exemption for the use of wine. Well, Catholic canon law, you know, for Catholic canon law, this is not optional. It's mandatory, at least as the you old know, canon lawyers have explained it to me. And you know, as I as I read the laws of Pesach, the use of wine is mandatory, not optional, except in certain sorts of health certain sorts of health cases. You know, and you know, you know, and and the Talmud is very very prescriptive, not only about the number of cups, but what count, what's the minimum size that counts as a cup. I've been able I've been unable to. Uh, discover any mandated maximum in the laws of Pesach, which is certainly consistent with the experience that all of us have had. Uh, but let me give a couple of even even tougher contemporary uh, contemporary arguments that are going on in Europe and may spread, God save us, to North America if we're very unlucky. In a number of European countries and in the UK, there is a collision between animal cruelty laws on the one hand and halal and kosher slaughter on the other. And even more disturbingly, and I have a long article on this coming out in a Catholic magazine, Commonweal, uh, I appear to be their favorite Jew, um, uh, there is a big movement now in Europe to define circumcision as child abuse. This is something that we need to think about. Here. But from, from the secular European perspective, they see no problem with this. Of course it's child abuse. Right? Because you're removing, you know, you're removing a, person, uh, a piece of an infant's body without his consent. Right? You're doing violence without consent. So finally, uh, let, me, you know, let me talk about one more ambiguity that this relationship raises. I've used the term religion in the past 20 minutes as though it were an entirely unproblematic concept. But anybody who does religious studies knows that it may, it's an idea, it may have a hard core, but it has a very fuzzy periphery. 
you know, where does religion leave off? That's an important question, you know, not just for scholarly purposes, but for legal and practical purposes. I don't have time to stand here and give you a glib an answer. Indeed, if I had all the time in the world, I couldn't give you an answer. Uh, perhaps Wittgenstein, Wittgenstein's notion of family resemblance could be deployed to deal, deal with this question. Suffice it to say that as American law and jurisprudence has developed, it has proved very difficult to draw the line between religion and conscience. And this fuzziness has become particularly important when, uh, when the United States had and may again have a mandatory military draft. Right? We have this category of conscientious exemption. What counts as the ground of conscientious objector? Right? What makes that valid? Do you have to be a Quaker? Do you have to be a member of religion that has an organized doctrine of nonviolence? Suppose your own conscience says, you know, here I stand, I can do no other. Right? And it just seems clear as day. You, you, you experience it as an internal command, but you cannot point to any body of organized doctrine other than your own reflections and this small, still voice, or maybe loud, angry voice that you hear within you. And so, in American jurisprudence, there's been a steady pressure to extend the idea of religion to encompass individual conscience in dealing, you know, in, in, uh, you know, in in trumping the force of otherwise valid civil laws. Why is this happening? I think we learned a lot about you know, culture in the contemporary West, or at least in my small slice of North America, uh, by asking ourselves that answer. I think yeah, asking ourselves that question, I think there are two leading answers above all. First of all, individualism has morphed into a kind of deinstitutionalization, which is now characterizing more and more of life in the United States. And major surveys of millennials, for example, young people between the ages of 18 and 18 and 34, people born since 1980, have revealed rampant deinstitutionalization in their thinking. They do not join organized anything. Right? And that goes for marriage, political parties, and also religious communities. More and more of them are unaffiliated, not disaffiliated, because they never affiliated in the first place. So that's the first thing that's going on. Here is the second thing. We are not only, we're not only living in an individualistic age, but also in an egalitarian age. And over and over again, at least south of the border, uh, one finds the following phenomenon. Someone advances a claim on the basis of whatever it may be, whether it's you know, individu individual talent uh, or gender uh, or group membership or religion. And the response is, what makes your claim more important than my claim? My claim is on par with yours. And so many people now take a look at the First Amendment to the US Constitution, and they say there's a deep injustice built into the idea that religion is somehow special. Now, the problem, the problem you can see immediately is that if religion is not special, and the kinds of claims that religion has made historically and constitutionally can be extended to almost the full panoply of claims that individuals and groups can bring against public power, then public power collapses. You, know, you, have, you, know, you have religion and conscience turned into a principle of anarchy. Right? And that is clearly a number of bridges too far. On the other hand, nobody has yet been able to trace out theoretically from a perspective, from a uh, you know, uh, rather uh, 
persuasively from either a theoretical or a jurisprudential point of view what the principle of limitation of these claims is. Individualism plus equality lean hard against any and all principles of limitations of these claims against civil authority. So this is, this is the conundrum that I leave, that I leave you with. Uh, it's, I think, hard to avoid uh, if you march down the road that I've been marching for the past 25 minutes. Uh, but it's something, it's something that in order to reach a stable new equilibrium, we're going to have to get our minds around. Thank you very much, and I can't tell you how eager I am to hear Professor Taylor's commentary. <laughs>
you have the same population belonging to the state, being members of the state, or citizens or subject of the state, and being members of the church or Uma and so on. Right? And you had in this kind of case, the issue obviously arises, how do these people, uh, how should they navigate the different demands on them? But supposing we start from another perspective, and this perspective came home to me when I started to discuss with my Indian colleagues about what they call secularism in India and the threats to that. And immediately, you could see a completely different way of posing the problem of roads. It was a problem about how diverse society, very diverse society, and you have in India one that's not diverse from yesterday but goes way, way back, could somehow become a democracy with the requirement that springs from democracy, they could bring these people from very diverse cultures and religions together in a way which allowed them maximally to practice, but also which didn't favor one over the other. Right? So that something like liberty and equality here, free exercise of religion, but also non-domination or non-prioritization <coughs> of one view over the other. Right? From that perspective, religion is a special, but very important case, a special case of diversity, which, which we have to somehow deal with in a, in a fair and equal way. And now if you start from that, I mean, frankly, uh, the thinking of the commission that we eventually worked on in Chapter 7 of the commission and the uh, report, and that actually, uh, you know, a colleague of mine, uh, Rosna McClure, and myself published as a laïcité et liberté de conscience, laïcité and freedom of conscience, is a result of that thinking. If you <laughs> read the report or read our book, you'll see that we make these references to Rajiv Bargo and other thinkers in India. So we were thinking from that end in. Now, why is that worthwhile doing? Well, because in different societies, the problem that gets people exercised can be the one or the other. In societies that are very much in the Western tradition, but not all of them, because the United States is an interesting outlier in this, it was how to reconcile. You know, in England, in France, in, in Catholic and Protestant European countries, the problem was how to reconcile. If you go to places in Scandinavia until very recently, there was still this uh, unanimity of everybody belonging to the national church who belonged to the to the kingdom, right? So the problem of reconciling and putting together these two sources of authority was the main problem. But if you look at it from the Indian perspective, it's quite different. Now, perhaps there are features of our present situation, our present situation even in Western societies, like this one, Quebec, which are more similar to the Indian case. Why? Well, because we have become, you know, this was, let's just speak of Francophone, Quebec, right? When I was young, and a lot of you people <laughs> younger than me were young, it was wall-to-wall -wall Catholic society. Well, not, not, okay, I'm exaggerating. It's a little bit, uh, it's 50 so years ago. Never, for me, that's yesterday. Right? Mm -hmm. was, and at the same time, it was trying to be a, a, a democracy. So the problem very much was posed in the, one, in the way that really makes sense in the European tradition. But now, we're living in a society which is tremendously diverse. And of course, this is not just us now. This is something which all Western societies are living in. You have, you have societies where people were used to the idea, or used to the experience of being in the same cultural outlook as everybody else, and then they're very disturbed by <coughs> the fact that society is becoming so diverse. You see this also in Scandinavian countries. You know, there's, I mean, there's wonderful attempts by societies like Sweden to uh, respond to this, even disestablishing the Lutheran Church in Sweden and so on. In other Scandinavian societies like in Denmark, you get this kind of crispation, <laughs> the people get uptight at this. And in our province, that is what also happens. So how does it help you to think it out in, let's call it, the Indian <laughs> or uh, Indian type? Perspective, rather than the Western Christendom 
if you want to go back far enough, type perspective. Well, because you really ask yourself, yourself questions like, why are they targeting religion? It's an interesting question. I mean, why? You know, that a lot of the things that people object to, things that they most have a right to object to, like honor killing, excision, female genital mutilation, are not mandated by any major world group. And these awful cultural practices also exist in societies which have different religions. Now, the reason why, one reason why these get alighted into religion is that if you go to certain traditional societies, they don't make a distinction between their whole culture and religion. And this is something you find very, very often. But where you are forced to make that distinction, you're asking the question, what are, what are the rulings of the you know, Al-Azhar uh, University on the issue of, <coughs> of a general mutilation, of honor killing, or what you, know, you find that there aren't, there are no uh, endorsements but it's classified as, it's a very ambivalent case, there, right? it's on the borderline, right? Why does it get classified as religious? So we're thinking about this, I don't want to go on for very long, but just think about it for a minute. Maybe it's because in societies like ours, which have this very strong ethic, uh, I mean, ethic of political ethic of rights and so on, it's not possible to say, you make me very uncomfortable. Please stop doing what you're doing or, or get out. If you read the, the Jeannette, right, it's clear that, I'm uh, sorry, but I'm very blunt here, it's clear that that's what's going on. And even sometimes they talk about, you know, I'm mad days, some day long. But, you know, you want to say to them, but the fact that it's, uh, it's, it creates a mad is not a reason in a liberal democracy to outlaw it. But if it can be presented as in the light of a danger of a religious practice, you know, like the neo aztec case, you know, that there are people engaging in religious practice which have these horrendous consequences. So when Jeanette Bertrand said in her presentation, she didn't make because, like all of us, the hearings were cut off, but she published it. C'est la religion qui préconise l'application des femmes. That's the religion that is uh, calling for stoning women. This is an appallingly ignorant, uh, uh, the religion, the whole religion is called this, appallingly ignorant. And it's astonishing that in our debate in Quebec, these people aren't called more often, but I don't want to get on to that. I want to get on to the issue of why, why think of this, frame it in terms of religion. Because if you framed it, Frame these differences in other ways, it wouldn't be acceptable. But the same goes on the other side. I mean, very often people who want to say we would like accommodation for our practices. We know that you have a rule that people shouldn't dress this way and that way, but we want this rule to be somehow bent. They demand for accommodation. Of course, there too, you see, the, the logic of our discussion makes it much more and I used to say, well, this is a religious obligation. And then you get these strange debates going on where people with atheists with a completely Catholic conception of what a religious obligation is. You know, the Pope has to say that. And you get that with Jews and Muslims who are, when there is no central authority, there are some rabbis, there are some uh, imams and so on. You get this strange thing going on. So another I don't want to go on too long, but another thing that jumps up at you, if you look at it, in, in the, the question of why religion, if you look at it in this other perspective that, that I'm uh, proposing, is the very powerful phenomenon of patrimonial religion, that is our past religion, the religion of the past, making claims on us today, and therefore making claims on others to respect us today. Right? So 
in the original version of the charter, you had these two, see these two very strange phenomena together. On one hand, targeting the Messie of Saint-Antoine of these other religions. On the other hand, wanting to keep the crucifix <laughs> above the speaker's chair in the National Assembly. And Madame Malois said, you know, it's not a matter of religion, it's not a religious sign, it's a patrimonial sign. Okay. <laughs> no, but this is very interesting because the very, very powerful forms of patrimonialization. Here again, the Indian case is very, very interesting and very informative. You see, the BJP, it's a lot of its original uh, intellectual founders of the whole tradition, like Savarkar, but they were atheists. atheists. This is very, very paradoxical. But they have this very important attachment to what they think of as the Hindu tradition. Right? So you get this strange word, Hindu, that wouldn't have been understood in the 18th century by anybody, right? which is what they're depending now. So you get this very strong claim, which actually is creating an imbalance. You have inequality where people from other faith traditions are put in the kind of shade and so on. But not because people make it. Of course, are, yeah, they're mobilizing and profiting from the mass piety when they organize people to go and smash up the battle of Masjid. Oh, yeah, yeah they're, they're profiting from this, but it's not something that they are seeing in the light of religious obligation, of the kind of piety they want to. <coughs> but but their, their definition of India. So we get from this point of view a series of questions that jump up, and we slide, interesting enough, in the same direction as Bill was sliding. That is, we find ourselves forced to consider the religious, religiously defined, or religiously originating obligations on people, along with others that are a matter of conscience. And that's why we try, and I'm, I'm, you know, there's a lot of problems with this, to make liberty of conscience our key general concept of which religious forms and certain non-religious forms would be, would be a, a species. Now, this doesn't fully work either because there are also the ways in which religion arises as problems, questions in our society, which can't be coped with simply by conscience. I mean, think of the role of what used to be called chaplains, you know, they, they talk about in, in, the, in hospitals in, in, in Quebec and so on, precisely because they're trying to broaden this out a little a bit away from religion. But the, some of the demands here that are met by our chapters are demands that are always going to be there. Somebody is impossible, and they want to speak to a rabbi, a priest, to a minister, or whatever. Or they, they have certain kinds of ritual that they really feel like must be allowed to, or their family must be allowed to carry out. To carry out. So there are all sorts of ways in which this, this, neither of these two uh, frameworks can solve all the problems. I think sometimes you can have a feeling that you can get a better handle on some problems from this one and sometimes from that one. But the two, again, the two which are thinking of the two authorities, and thinking starting from the issue of diversity and equality on the other hand. I think we need a kind of, how should I say, a kind of bilingual, bicultural, bi-intellectual uh, way of, of raising these problems, trying to see how to deal with them. And each perspective brings certain things to light. Uh, the second one, the one I've been really talking about here, if I can just say it quickly, what it brings to light is the dubious implication of religion, both negative. We want to, your terrible practices you know, belonging to your religion force us to <coughs> to stop you or whatever it is, and then it turns out it's not necessarily religious. So these negative ones, and there are very, I think, inauthentic implications, positively, when the patriarchy. Was it patrimony of a religion that 
most of the people concerned don't believe in anymore is used to force on others the acceptance of certain signs and, and so on. Right. So I'm sorry I made everything less clear. <laughs> but I think, yeah, if you struggle through to some kind of understanding here, it'll help. Temporary confusion might help. Well, thank you very much. I have a question concerning um, just how you how you open how you open your talk. Thank you so much for thank you so much for your thoughts. Um, I have a question concerning how you open. You sort of you, you made a lot of interesting comparisons in between um, sort of the civil world and the religious world. But it sort of it occurred to me that that often sort of it occurred to me that often um, sort of social mores arise from certain religious practices that then become ingrained into law. So how would you respond to sort of how how religious practices inform law and vice versa and how and how might that affect your categorization that you'd end your lecture with? Well, do you understand my question? I do. I believe I understand your question, <laughs> although my response to it may reveal that I don't. <laughs> Fair. Right. And, you know, there, look, there is, you know, there is no question about the fact that, you know, the phenomenon that you're talking about is a real one. And, you know, I know the history of my own country better than any other. And I can, you know, and I can tell you that, you know, that throughout the 19th century and a substantial portion of the 20th century, Century, there was what sociologists called an informal Protestant establishment. And what that meant was that not just our practices but our laws were inflected by what might be called the architecture of Protestantism. Uh, and if I have a lot of time, I can walk you through all sorts of examples of that. One of the most interesting developments in my country in the past half century has been a theoretical and jurisprudential attack on the idea of an informal establishment that has been woven into law. And so, you know, to use to use language that would get me into great trouble uh, if I you know if I ever if I ever used it in print and you know it, it has implications that I don't necessarily endorse. But a lot of lawyers and political movements have tried to purify civil law of those aspects of informal establishment. And you know, one of the one of the most controversial, enduringly controversial cases in American law, you know, has to do with administered school prayer, which I suspect is might be a problem elsewhere as well. And, and you know, every you know, everybody took it for granted that, well, it was okay to read the Bible in school, you know, and you could read it, you know, you could just read it, the individual confronted the text. There was no consciousness of the fact, you know, that that in fact encoded a very distinctively Protestant practice that Catholics felt impelled to establish a parallel school system precisely because they objected to that way of reading. There was no acknowledgement of the fact that the version of the Lord's Prayer that was recited in public schools when I was in public school was the Protestant version, et cetera. It just seemed natural that that's the way it should be. And American law has come under attack to the extent that vestiges of that kind of secularized Protestantism could still be found within it. They're fewer and fewer now, it's, but you're absolutely right. Thank you. My question concerns um, global degradation or the environmental degradation is one challenge that we're facing going forward and another one is the huge discrepancy between the rich and the poor and I would like to hear what leadership has come either from the civil side or from the religious side to address these challenges and the last comment would be maybe the generation coming up has lost confidence both on the religious and the secular authority because they feel that they're irrelevant. And a, a student protester made the comment, 
that we're not going to get involved in politics. This was just last week, but we will have our voices heard. So that's my my, my question. Is it, too, is it clear enough? Is it about it's very clear, and I'm going to say just a few words and then turn it over to Taylor. <laughs> I suspect that's, <laughs> I, I, you know, unless he doesn't want me to turn it over to him, but that that, that would be sort of counterintuitive somehow. <laughs> uh, first of all. I have, to, I have to report to you that from the perspective of the experience of my country, the epicenter of concern about the gap between the rich and the poor is in organized religion in the United States, much more so than in the dominant forms of secular thinking. And one can see evidence of this globally in the extraordinary impact that the new pope has had year and a day, simply by adverting to historic Catholic social thought on precisely this question. So if one is talking about the issue of the rich and the poor, uh, then I think that, you know, at least in the West, organized religion is more correctly categorized as part of the answer than part of the problem. It's a controversial summary statement. Let me pick up another point that you made. Uh, you know, I believe it was Trotsky who once said that you may not be interested in the dialectic, but the dialectic is interesting in you. Uh, and, you know, I would say to today's young people who are disaffected from politics but think that they have a parallel way of acting to change the world, uh, I know why they think that, but I believe they're wrong. Ultimately, you know, we can't have two parallel lines. You know, one, you know, the network of young people and the other structures of authority. Ultimately, in some non-Euclidean political space, these two lines have to converge. Uh, and one of the things, if, if you compare in the United States the Tea Party to the Occupy Wall Street movement, the big difference between them is that the Tea Party from the start understood the need to engage in official politics, even though it began as a classic protest movement. I monitored the discussions within the Occupy Wall Street movement very carefully, and because they were so mistrustful of politics, they decided to, decided to hold themselves apart from it, and ultimately the movement weakened and fractured and became less influential than it might have been if they had thought about the second stage. That is, a more direct engagement in the incidents of official politics. You will note that I have left the environmental question entirely untouched because it is too vast. You posed three questions. I addressed two of them. Perhaps Professor Taylor wants to address the third. No, I agree with this last point that, uh, that was made. I, mean, I would add a codicil or uh, motivation to it. I mean, I agree certainly that, let's say, Occupy or the, the, the plant I have here, right? In the end, they just didn't have the effect that they were supposed to have. And there were a certain amount of betrayal involved in that, and they got to give a clock taking, taking them up and then and, and, uh, propping them. And now that they have uh, you know, somebody to avoid again, just gone, and they, it, it was going to be in their caucus, it, it's unlikely that they'll follow that up further. But that makes me enter my uh, a caveat but addition to this, they have to think more in terms of how it intersects. But we, and I don't know we, we who are active in various kinds of parties as I am, have to think more about how it intersects. And that means a certain kind of quality of listening, a set of contacts and so on. And it means not engaging, which we often do, in a kind of dismissive attitude towards them. These kids don't understand what they're doing, etc. So but so I'm now going to reformulate Bill's point from a, sort of not the standpoint of either them or us, but from the standpoint of the whole system of getting democracy out of the out of the the, uh, the rut that it is now in. And there has to be some way of making more bridges, more contact between these two kinds of movements, which are always going to go on existing. That is, how we're going to go on existing. We parties that were push things ahead for, for reform. But these other movements are going to come up again and again because people are fed up in the way that you, you describe. 
we have to find a way of becoming more, of intersecting more, and that's a common problem we have, not just the problem of the kids. Uh, Professor Under? I want to ask a question. I'm not sure if it has philosophical weight, but I wanted to ask about civility. Uh, that is somewhere between the state and, and the individuals. The way people relate in liberal democracies always seems to me to depend on what I'm calling civility, which is not legislative. And I wonder what, what, how you read the effect of the diversification of society, the kind of hyper-diversification of society in the past however many years it is, on civility. The civility, or the, the decline of civility that we certainly put this in a whole uh, is that consequence of this diversification? Can it be legislated? Is, is there a way to restore it? Is, is this a question that can be discussed in, in the terms of your thought? Mm -hmm. I think we have to. I think that you see, there's a certain number of debates going on all the time which we have to do with it. And we're relating of this to, uh, to uh, diversity, the relation of civility to diversity. So all the various theories that are put forth in Canada Slogans, multiculturalism, anti ethnicism in Quebec, are attempts to grapple with that. Grapple with that how? By both calming people's fears that arise from difference, but also showing the positive side that we, what can be gained by living in society where we accept each other and interchange in this way. Now, it can't be legislated by governments, but it can be destroyed or undermined by political leadership. And that's exactly what we see in mm -hmm. Quebec in the last year. I mean, the idea of putting together the fight against religious anti-existence, let's say, in English fundamentalism, and the banning of these signs, as though the people wearing these signs were somehow advancing anti-existence or fundamentalism and so forth, has had an appalling effect on our civility. And it's not because the majority of Quebecers are in civil, it's because every society has a number, a minority of people who are xenophobic and highly uncivil. But a lot of the time, they feel they haven't got the legitimacy to speak up. And it is Denaville and Marois, I mean, I mean, very blunt, who have done us the incredible disservice of giving these people a justification which allows them. Right. <laughs> uh, let me, you know, let me now give you a response to your very interesting question from the American, from the perspective of the United States. Uh, I'm going to withhold judgment on whether your question has philosophical weight, but I can tell you, but I can tell you this: it certainly has sociological weight. And let me explain what I mean. You know, the best American sociology of the past has, I think, converged on two depictions of, of important changes that have happened in my country as a consequence of the increased, the amazing increase in the diversity of our population. Um, you know, the United States made two momentous decisions in 1965. You know, one was the Voting Rights Act, and the other was reopening the immigration gates that had been slammed shut in 1924. The first had an immediate impact on our society. The second was like a time release capsule. It's been transforming us bit by bit. We are a new, different America now. What has been the sociological consequence of this increased diversification? Two things that may sound paradoxical, but they're not. Number one, we are far more tolerant society than we used to be. You know, the scope of things that can be acted out, not just privately, but publicly, you know, without evoking withering censure, let alone the you know, full force of the law, has, you know, since I came to adulthood about 50 years ago, to the extent that I know, <laughs> you know, you know it, it's, it's breathtaking. The other big development, the consequence of diversity, is the rise of mistrust. And Robert Putnam, you know, the you know, the political scientist and sociologist, has done some of the pioneering work in this area. It depressed him so much that he told me that he was reluctant to publish it. 
right? But he finds a direct linkage between the rise of diversity and the decline of social trust in the United States. And the new millennial generation, according to a study from the Pew Research Center that came out just last week, is simultaneously the most tolerant and the least trustful generation in modern American history. We have to think. That may sound like a paradox. It's not, but it's a big problem, right? Having spread our arms wide to create a more diverse society and having paid a big price in the collapse of social trust, is it possible to take the gains from diversity and build on them to reintegrate the society on a new foundation? That's the challenge for the next generation. It's a big, big challenge. It's a challenge not just for the society, but all, you know, since it also affects the relationship between the citizens and their government, it's a challenge for our politics.